Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I'm here with the CEO and co-founder of Undigital, Ryan Millman. Ryan, how are we doing? I'm doing fantastic. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you for calling in. Ryan is actually calling it in from Maryland. So just a quick throw away from Portland. When I mean quick, I mean across the entire country. But I, I've been to Mar I've been out to the DC area, folks. If you have not been out to the DMV, please check it or the DMV, please check it out. It is a gorgeous place. But enough about Maryland and the East Coast. Ryan, give us a little background. Who is Ryan Millman? Yeah, yeah. Well, my story kind of starts, um, gosh, as sort of a, a young kid. Uh, I was always into athletics, was not into school. And um, so along the way, I think my parents were quite concerned about me. Um, didn't do very good in, in my schoolwork. Um, I got into college, went out to school in Arizona, beautiful college. Um, I was the kid in the back of class, not paying attention to what the teachers were saying, but instead dreaming up ideas and sort of sketching out business models of uh, potential companies I could come up with to, uh, to, to sort of go out on my own and become an entrepreneur. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, the fabric of, of uh, you know, I, I'd say my career has always been around, um, you know, the funny part is, is that education was not a, a, a very important part of, of my childhood, but education has kind of become uh, a staple and a hallmark for me as I've been able to grow uh, my businesses. Um, became a, a student of, um, of learnings and, and really dove into every book, every podcast out there, uh, you know, to figure out how could I really uh, create a successful company. Started my, my first company when I was 21. Uh, at the time, the search engines were Hotbot and Lyco, so very early days. Um, was really excited. It took me several years to get the first company going, but subsequently, I've started many companies, started five companies, um, got about 300 overall employees in the organization. Uh, high level, we were able to build the company from just a, a couple thousand dollars to $50 million a year in, in annual revenues um, and uh, get to work on some really fun things. Man, that is it. That is pretty phenomenal. I think that's probably most entrepreneurs dream is to be able to scale their business to a $50 million reoccurring revenue. I know that would definitely be one of my aspirations, certainly. Now, be, now let's talk a little bit about Undigital. It's actually really cool because essentially you're kind of helping support small businesses think about branding so tell us a little bit about what undigital is yeah and digital is really exciting um you know we uh, I, I we own uh, several e-commerce uh, companies and i've got about a hundred thousand square feet of fulfillment space where we ship out all these orders and and e-commerce is just this massive industry there's you know 40 billion packages a year that are getting shipped out worldwide um, and the marketer in me, you know, we know what marketing best practices look like in marketing. It's all about relevancy, you know, the relevancy of the message, getting the right message to the right customer, wherever they are. If you think about the package going out to a customer, that is a touch point. It's a very important touch point in e-commerce. Um, but the touch point has not had marketing best practices, right? At best e-commerce brands, maybe they could pre-print a whole bunch of things and drop the same leaflet or insert or collateral into the package. So everyone gets something that's really not relevant, um, has little benefit. Um, and, and so, you know, the light bulb moment was for me being in our own fulfillment centers and just seeing all those packages and saying, wow, like we can do better. Like there's a better way. How do we get a, a personalized, you know, communication, personalized collateral inside each and every package? And I just got obsessed with this idea. Um, and I remember just in the last 10 or 15 years, I'd always have an idea around marketing technology and I said, gosh, wouldn't this be great? And I just never got to it. And somebody else eventually would come out with it, which was fantastic. This idea, I couldn't kick. It wasn't available. I couldn't find it. I said, we're going to build this. And I hired all the best engineers I could find, invested a lot of money to, to do this really for our own brands. But essentially what we invented is what we call in-package personalization. It's an automated way uh, to go ahead and, and drop in at our fulfillment center, very curated, very personalized collateral into each and every user's package. Our platform where all of our ads and all of our campaigns get created is very much like Facebook ads for packages. So we have all this logic that lives on our, on our front end software. Uh, we're running all these different campaigns. We have a full analytics suite so we can track the conversion rate of every campaign. And so we get the A-B test and we get the conversion rate optimize this channel to, uh, to drive success. I'll give you a couple of examples just, just for your listeners to better understand what kinds of things can be done. 
you know, um, targeting your first time, you know, customers, right? They're very different than your repeat or your most loyal customers. Uh, we'll do things like, you know, uh, testing version A, version B, our best welcome message. This could be in what looks like a handwritten note. It could be a graphical marketing piece. Um, if somebody orders uh, from us and they're not in our loyalty program, we might want to say, you know, hey, Gabriel, um, you know, you're not, you're not signed on for our loyalty program. These are all the benefits. Maybe you are in the loyalty program and we'll let you know, hey, you've got 522 points. You're $20 away from our platinum status. Uh, we can give specific product information. So, hey, thanks for ordering the moisturizing cream. Here's how you apply it. Because you have dry skin, these are the other products we know you're going to love. There's really no limit. It's taking that customer data, looking at that customer and serving up very helpful. It could be informational, but certainly um, content that helps drive that next action. Man, I, I love this because one of the things we kind of talked about pretty consistently on the show is, is the marketing funnel, right? And the, the importance of that. And essentially folks what this is, and I really love this concept because you know, you're, you're doing some marketing segmentations for your customers. Hey, who's currently on the loyalty program versus not. Uh, and you know, you're saving this in a CRM and then utilizing that data, right. To then curate a package for them. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs are under the impression that, you know, customized packaging is actually really expensive and very difficult to do. Is that true or not? Well, when we first started looking at it, we actually started looking at the actual packaging itself, right? You, look, you think about the box, the corrugate and printing, and that is kind of expensive. And we said, well, how can we do this in a way that is both economical and truly one-to-one -one marketing? And so we're printing paper collateral. Now, it is gorgeous, you gorgeously printed full color marketing collateral. It's thick, it's tac you know, tactile, it feels good. Uh, it can be in the format of a brochure. It could be an individual insert. It could be uh, what looks like a handwritten note. And so it's an economical way to do this at scale. And it's an automated process for us. You mentioned um, the data. So, you know, brands connect their CRM to us automatically. So let's say you have Shopify, we have an app that takes about five minutes, your data flows in, and then you get to create all of this different logic that, that lives in the undigital platform. In your fulfillment center, at the time you're fulfilling, let's say Sarah's order, you know, a little call comes in digital in the background and says, hey, we're, we're fulfilling Sarah's order. Sarah's a first time customer, not in the loyalty program, ordered these products. You know, we take all this data about Sarah, there could be 50 other data points, and we're instantly serving at that moment, the right collateral for Sarah. And it just pops out for the operator, gets included in the box, and then we're tracking Sarah's future behaviors, right? Um, so it's, it's very easy to, to set up and establish, and customers love it. I mean, it's got their name on it. They open their package. It's 100% open rate. Um, and, you know, when you give something that's personalized to a customer, number one is it puts a smile on their face. It makes them feel connected to your brand. Um, but when you're giving them specific tips and helpful information and guiding them along and curating other products, it's amazing. What I didn't realize when I started this company, my goal was like, let's just connect with our customers. Let's make them feel special. Let's give them personalized you know, information. The lift and reorder rates was so much greater than I had anticipated. Our average brands get between a seven and 10% increase in reorder rates. So it's a very profitable channel and it just keeps getting better as you use the data that comes into our dashboards, the analytics data to just keep making the campaigns better and better. You know, it's, it's, it's very interesting because, uh, you, you mentioned, you know, the customized packaging. I got to tell you, folks, I receive, you know, snail mail pretty consistently here at the house. And and one thing I always get is uh, this credit card offer. And I know it's always a credit card offer, but the package they send it in is it's like, almost like implores me to open it because it's so customized and it has my name and it kind of looks like a handwritten. I, I still know it's a dang credit card offer, but I still open it just because the packaging is so alluring, you know, and, and it's, it's very interesting how that psyche does kind of play a little bit of a role in, in whether or not you're going to open your mail. Well, you know, I think this, I, I, look, marketing works is one of the biggest industries. And obviously there's so many channels. I'm a proponent of all channels, but the goal is to find incrementality, meaning we need to find incremental revenue. Um, so we need to make sure every dollar we're spending is truly additive. And that's one of the great things that I love about our channel is in the past, you know, we really didn't have tracking tools to look at things like pre-printing flyers and putting them into packages. With Undigital, not only are we fully personalized, but we are measuring everything. And what we love to do is we love to run holdout groups uh, in the early days. So let's look at sending a, a portion of your customers with fully personalized uh, messaging inside, and then we will hold out a group. And so we can actually deliver back to the brands and the C-suite of the brands. Hey, look at the step change. Look at the lift of people, uh, you know, the spend that we're getting, the increase in reorder rates, the increase in LTV. You know, it's significant. And 
what's also really interesting to me is, you know, so many brands have gotten really mature in some of these other channels. So if you've been at Facebook for a while or Google search or Google shopping, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to sort of like squeeze out little incremental wins. Packaging is blue ocean. Like you plug in a personalization system by in digital and like you're going from zero to hundred because most brands, you know, we're the inventor. So most brands, you know, uh, you know, are still not, you know, using personalization in the package. There's just so many brands out there. So it's just a great opportunity to, to turn on something really new and to drive a pretty big outcome from it. Yeah. And you know, one of the things you mentioned too, is, is you like to, you like to leverage all of the different platforms. Um, and, and one of the things you are also talking about is, uh, you know, essentially acquiring all of this data, right? Now, with that said, uh, what are some different avenues, you know, entrepreneurs can look at to capture this page, uh, this customer information uh, outside of a newsletter and blog? Yeah, well, a lot of the information, so because we're e-commerce based, you know, the, the inf a lot of the information is flowing in uh, from the order itself. So your customer places an order, we know what they ordered, we know what their AOV is. Um, some of our customers might tag them uh, with certain personas. Obviously, we have first name to personalize with first name. Um, you're capturing loyalty information. If you have a loyalty program, are they signed in for your SMS program or not? Um, did they have an interaction with customer service? You know, we do a lot of things that are, you know, it doesn't always have to be a direct response very marketing heavy piece. In fact, the best marketing is really just authentic marketing. It's, it's feeling like you're talking to a person, not a brand. So what a lot of our customers do is they'll do things like, you know, if you had an interaction with customer service, um, customer service will actually type in a note into the CRM. It'll flow into the undigital platform and you'll actually get a note. Let's say um, let's say you had an issue with your order and it was a, it was a late ship, uh, but you had to talk to a customer service agent. We'll actually put out what looks like a handwritten note. It's pretty much indistinguishable. It's printed, um, but the note might be from that agent saying, hey, you know, Julie, I'm so sorry for the delay. I'm glad we were able to get the resolve. It was great speaking with you you know, from the agent, right? So it's, it's again, it's just an authentic way to, wow, this brand really cares. Um, it's a meaningful moment. Putting a smile on a customer's face, even if it's small, that's marketing gold, right? It connects in their brain. You're sort of creating this image and you're, you're making this connection and that's powerful. Um, I think the biggest, uh, the, the biggest driver of success in e-commerce, in my opinion, I talk a lot about this is the idea of, you know, customers loving your brand. Now, if you think about the landscape of all your customers, you're going to have some customers that had a bad interaction and they're your detractors. You're going to have a lot of customers that like you and had a, a fine experience, but maybe not noteworthy. And then you're going to have a, a small amount of customers that love you. You know, that is the goal. That is worth so much. So the real question is, how do we get more customers from liking us to loving us, right? And what is customer love? Customer love is the combination of great products and great experience, right? Think about any dinner you've gone to. We've had thousands of dinners, like the few that you actually remember, it's those two things. It's both a great product, great food, plus an interesting experience, maybe a story, maybe a waiter told you something that, that stuck with you, right? Um, and so, you know, it's the same in e-commerce. Um, we come in on the experiential side and it, it just has such an impact because all of the e-commerce brands out there, you're competing with so many other customers. Those little things, those little touches are the difference to get those customers to be you know, patrons of you when they have so many choices. Those little things add up. And I don't think enough brands actually focus on a budget around just this idea of customer love. We all focus on acquisition budget and you know, uh, we're focusing on getting uh, customers through the funnel. And great things, and they're important, but gosh, there's nothing more important than figuring out what do we need to do to get more of these customers that like us to love us. Customer love is what builds market share and maximizes profits for all brands. Yeah, and you know, you brought up a lot of great points there, right? And, you know, one of the things you're talking about the restaurants, you know, we've all been to a phenomenal restaurant, had a great experience. Uh, and we've we've all probably all had an RSVP, at, you know, a nice four star restaurant. But I got to tell you, folks, you're your brand and your 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 marketing starts at the very beginning of that uh, customer interaction. So, for example, if I have a seven thirty uh, reservation and I don't get sit down till eight p.m., I don't care how good there is, how good that food is, I'm probably never going to go back to that restaurant, right? Because the service wasn't there. My what we consider valuable is our time as well. Uh, you know, historically, I would say uh, Nordstrom, their brand was always known for being being willing to take anything back, right? You can return anything to Nordstrom. You take a tire back, right? And that was that's really where that loyalty is, as Ryan was mentioning, how you become uh, an, kind of a, a someone that's engaged with the brand to becoming loyal to the brand. Because at the end of the day, you're not just trying to find someone that's willing to reach in their back pocket, pull out their wallet and pay you. 
You want that, yes, but you also want them to share that product on the line, right? Share it on the social media, just talk about that product in a way that, hey, this is why it was valuable to me because that's free marketing, free advertisement, and that's what you create a loyal brand, right? When you have individuals engaging with you uh, on your on your website, on your social channels, and you're not engaging back, you're losing a loyal consumer because they probably feel you don't care about them. Another thing, you know, Ryan said was that, that just, you know, sitting in time, just in general, if if I go to any any place and I'm waiting in line, now good customer service. If the individual that's sitting there, the concierge or person at the front desk looks around and says, "Hey, give me one moment. I'm helping this individual." They just bought themselves five more minutes of time simply by acknowledging me, by acknowledging me that I'm sitting there waiting, and they acknowledge that. That right there will actually ease a lot of individual stress because now they feel seen and cared for and about, right? And that's, again, going back to that customer service piece, uh, creating that loyal customer, it really does start with the frontline employees and, and it's a top-down approach. Your leadership has to really be involved and ingrained into the customer experience and making sure that that customer experience is, is flawless because that is actually the brand. Right. At the end of the day, that's what they're going to remember the brand as. I completely agree. I mean, everything is customer experience, every interaction, every touch point, your website, how you answer the phone. What's the inflection in the operator's voice? Right. You can say the same thing in different ways. Um, you can greet them in different. You can say the same words, but, you know, it does it sound you know cheery or, or optimistic or positive or monotone. So, you know. Everything is marketing, right? Everything's an opportunity. And us as um, as entrepreneurs, you know, the goal is continuous improvement, right? Like we're, it's hard starting a company. It's hard, put, you know, having all these touch points. Take what's your baseline today. And obviously, you know, we have to continue to go there. We have to continue to go to the North Star, which is improvement to, to betterment. And if you don't know what that is, it looks like, find the people that are doing it the best. And there's no shame in figuring out what they've done, right? There's so many people that have written the rules of the road for us. And that's what I did in the early days. You know, I started, um, you know, in, in some of the industries I started, I didn't really have the knowledge. And I said, hey, who's doing it the best? Let me learn from them. Let me see what that looks like. And eventually, you know, you can start innovating and coming up with new things. You don't have to, um, you know, invent everything, right? A lot of stuff is out there. Uh, a lot of, there's a lot of knowledge. We have more knowledge available to us than we ever have. Um, but the goal is to continuous, continuously improve. I think one of the tangible things that businesses can do today and going back to this idea of, you know, um, you know, we're, we're offering services. Again, we've got customers that are enjoying our service at different levels. Maybe you don't really know what you, you need to do to sort of improve. There's nothing more powerful than I'd say surveying the customers that like you, right? Uh, the ones that hate, you know, are, are not happy, you know, you're not going to get them uh, to come back. You've already got this group of customers that are really loyal. Those loyal customers are probably a significant portion of your revenue. Let's look at this biggest swath here, right? How do we get more of these customers in the middle? Uh, let them tell you, you know, let's really figure out what are the things that, that we're missing. Maybe it's a service offering. Maybe it's a product offering. Maybe it's ship times or shipping costs or whatever it might be, right? You know, that is really valuable feedback because that helps inform sort of what your roadmap can be. If you ask the right phrasing questions to that group of people, you know, they tell you that, yeah, they like you. They give you a, 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 an OK score. Hey, what are the things that we can do that would make you love us or get us to a nine or get us to a 10? And, and as you start to combine those those survey scores and really uh, see what those items are, it's great um, discovery for your team to start to take some of those items, get them on the roadmap get them in place and start to win over more customers in, in a very healthy way. Yeah. Engaging your employees early uh, during that conversation also is a very s smart idea. You know, my, my former directories have a saying, if you're not getting com comparatively better, you're getting competitively worse. So, you know, always, always look uh, to see what's changing in the market. Now, Ryan, you mentioned it, you know, Starting a business is difficult, but you also mentioned you started on digital because you had created so many other businesses. So let's take a step back. What was your first entrepreneurial endeavor and why did you decide to get into entrepreneurship? Uh, yeah, I, I, I was just obsessed with the idea. I didn't, um, didn't want to work for anybody else. I, I just didn't see myself doing that. And um, I was a kid growing up selling baseball cards to shows. I always sort of just kind of had that bug. Um, my first business was, I started in 1999 and, um, at the time digital cam, the first digital camera just came out. It was a Casio three megapixel camera. Um, you know, I remember buying it and going to a restaurant and everybody in the restaurant was like, what is that? People were staring as I was taking pictures and looking at them in the back of the screen. Seems silly today, but it was so novel. And, um, I got the idea to, um, 
take pictures at college events and get them on the internet. Nobody had their picture on the internet in 99, right? Again, hop out and like us were the search engines. You know, there were some texts on the internet. It was very new. And so I figured out how to write some batch actions to take these photos, turn them into thumbnails, get them posted to a web page, handed out cards, uh, got people from uh, University of Arizona to go to the website. It just became such an instant hit. People were telling their friends all over the country, hey, take a look at, you know, uh, I'm online with this girl I'm dating or this guy I'm dating or my friends. And, you know, seeing pictures and, and having people directed to a web page where they could view them was really, really interesting. I quickly expanded to about 20 colleges, started uh, figuring out how to sell the pictures, had ad revenue because everyone in 99 had ad revenue, um, scaled to 40, 50 colleges, and then turned that into actually doing the annual um, portraits for fraternity and sororities. So we went from sort of party pictures for fraternities and sororities and college events to these annual portraits. The fraternities and sororities are pretty much in every college and every year they take portraits, create products, um, kind of pivoted into that business after a few years. And we, we actually still do that at about 600 colleges every year. We have hundreds of photographers that travel around and take all these different photographs. So, you know, uh, the business took several years before I actually found you know, profitable footing. It was exciting. I was like, we're going to figure this out. Uh, there were good days and bad days. Business is like schizophrenia. Like one day, you, you know, got the dopamine, you're like, this was a great day. And the next day it can be like, oh God, what am I doing here? Like, is this going to work? Um, but you've got to have more optimism than not. And as soon as I got that business going on really good footing, uh, I had a, a early employee who ended up, I said, hey, you're now in charge. I'm going to do the next company. And I just kind of kept looking at tangential and other opportunities with, with bigger markets and kind of just kept uh, getting into new things, bringing in good people. Me personally, I, I'm not the kind of person, I don't really love being in a, a medium or larger business where um, you become mature and there's it's a lot of HR and admin. I like the puzzle that hasn't been figured out. I like kind of getting things going and solving for for, for opportunities. You know, one of the things people don't know is, is you essentially, you, you mentioned, you know, you, you started this little photo uh, business and then you started getting under the brands. So you essentially started with a $5,000 startup yeah. to multiple brands generating millions of revenue. How yeah. did you Well, the way that I did it was really um, being in the weeds of every dollar spent. I mean, I didn't have access to capital. I never even thought about raising capital. I didn't even think I was fundable. It was never something I thought about. And frankly, I never really wanted to be responsible for anybody else. I didn't care how hard I would work. And and fortunately, being sort of a college age, I didn't have a family. And so I loved every day because I learned so, so much how to make a website, you know, the legal, the accounting, all this sort of stuff. But every dollar had to be meaningful, right? And so I had to really, um, you know, I started my advertising budget with 50 bucks and that 50 bucks turned into a couple really great accounts. And then I went to a hundred dollars and then I went to a couple thousand dollars. And then obviously eventually today, you know, we have seven figures in advertising budgets across our businesses, but it was very calculated. And I think one of the big misconceptions and people always think this like, oh man, I'm not as risky as you. I'm like the least risky person. You know, if I put a hundred dollars in a slot machine and lose it, like I'm, I'm pissed and you know, I, I don't like to gamble. And so really it's really understanding what's happening at the root level. And so I think when you think about your company and, and what your core companies are, I think almost all businesses, especially in e-commerce, like you have to be good at marketing. So marketing is something I had to learn. I never outsourced it and say, Hey, here's some money, go figure this out. And, and I'm going to hope that you know what you're doing. I literally studied, became a student of the game. So going back to the education, uh, I, I just, I love learning, but you know, I was passionate about this as opposed to sort of a traditional schooling. And every day I read a little bit more. I tried to find a nugget, but I did the work. You know, I went to Google AdWords. I tried to figure out, you know, all the best ways to drive uh, the channel and I got it going, got the engines working. It's all about building profitable engines and marketing. Um, and scaling your dollars appropriately. So, you know, when you have a little bit of money, you can only grow so much, but we started to get, we started to get some movement, right? We started to use what we had, the few thousand dollars that turned into more as the cash flow comes in, it, it does get easier, but it took years and years and years to get, you know, really get to like a decent point. Um, and as we got more chips, you know, we were able to sort of make bigger investments, but the thesis never changed. The investments never got more risky. They were just bigger dollars, um, but they had bigger return profiles, bigger opportunities. So things kind of get sweeter as you go, but the early days are, are super hard. And, and the best advice is you just got to get through it. You got to get through it with optimism. You got to bring optimism to your entire team. You can't do anything with pessimism. Um, and you got to rally your team, say, hey, we're going to go there. We're going to figure this out. We're going to give it all we have. Um, uh, but you've got to do it in a, in a pragmatic way. 
Yeah. And I, I really love what you said in regards to, you know, going out and just reading and listening to a bunch of podcasts, because folks, there's a lot of free education out there from a business uh, acronym perspective that is available to you at the tip of your fingers. In fact, no other time than right now have we had probably more information in our front pocket, right, in our phone than ever any other time before, as, as Ryan was saying. You know, he used to take actual photos and then go and upload them, make them with thumbnails. And now, you know, you take a photo on your phone and it's automatically on your computer, right? So, so you know, take the advantage of the the, the education that we have available. And, and Ryan, one of the things you also mentioned was, was funding. What key lessons did you learn from funding and growing your privately owned businesses? Well, I think the main thing for me was um, it was just diligence. I mean, you know, again, it was all privately funded. It was very, you know, there wasn't a lot of funding there. Um, but, you know, I'd say this, um, you know, I had to hire people when I couldn't even pay myself. And, you know, it was uh, early days. And, you know, these are the sacrifices you make. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just it's just kind of par for the course. And so, you know, as the entrepreneur, I mean, you know, the the tough times are, are on you. Uh, and cer certainly if you can make it to the other side, the sweeter times, you know, become your victories for sure. Um, and so I'd say, you know, that's what the entrepreneurship journey is about. It's obviously about getting to the other side and building value. I, I think some of the biggest lessons though, are the journey was incredible. And obviously I've, I've been able to have a lot of success in my career. Um, but looking back at those early days and, you know, there was nothing more exciting than that. And sometimes you don't re always realize it while you're going through it. The, you start to gain an unfair knowledge advantage. That is the biggest, that is, you can bank that on your balance sheet, your life personal balance sheet uh, forever. And I think whether you make it to the other side in venture number one, or you don't, that journey is so valuable to you and your long-term ability to drive success. And I think, you know, taking a step back, trying to breathe and recognizing that is, is super helpful, but there's no replacement for putting in the work. Um, I put a lot of hard work in those early days. I have a family now. I think I work a lot smarter. Um, you know, I focus on, you know, really important things. And I realize when I'm not doing something important, hey, I can take a break. You know, uh, I used to feel like I could never take a break. I'd feel bad if I went out to do something that was uh, for a personal day. Um, I think one thing I'd like to share sort of with the group, because I think this is sort of a, a topic that doesn't get talked about enough, is that, you know, all of us have good days and bad days. And there's a mental struggle that so many have, and it's completely normal. If every day you're just, everything's perfect, gosh, I'd like to meet that individual. It's rarely discussed, but entrepreneurship is a really difficult you know, path. And um, I think one thing that's really helpful is to have this conversation with your entire team. I, a lot of times us as the entrepreneur, we take it all on and we don't want our team to feel like anything's ever wrong. I actually like to take the opposite approach and just say like, hey, I, it's okay to tell me when you're having a bad day because I'm gonna have bad days too, right? Um, more, more times than not, we're gonna be optimistic and we're gonna solve problems together but it's not always going to be good. It's a roller coaster. That is part of the ride. I think we need to be able to be um, public about that with our teams, have our team support us. Um, don't feel like, you know, everything is, is, is on you and you're the only person that's sort of, you know, having a rough day. It's, it's very hard to internalize that. So definitely have outlets. Um, believe me, there's others around you that are going through it. Other entrepreneurs, I'm sure people in your company are dealing with tough times. Startups are hard and they take a lot of people with a lot of grit and determination. Um, but you're definitely not in it alone. Yeah, you know, that's, that's a great point. And I think that's a, that's a testament to kind of the entrepreneurs in, in general, because it, there are some uh, long, lonely nights uh, in entrepreneurship. And now with that said, let's talk about the importance of resilience and adaptability in entrepreneurship. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think, um, you know, for me, I can speak for me and I, I'd say this, you know, um, a lot of times and, and I think we're all familiar with sort of like the MVP, uh, this sort of idea of like creating something, kind of seeing if it can flourish. Uh, I've lived my whole career uh, by that. And out of all the different industries and different businesses I got into, so much of the outsized value that I created was in like, hmm, let me try this little thing here. And I'm wondering if this could be turned into something. And I, I remember even having people at my my own company be like, oh, Ryan, you're wasting your time. Like, oh, let me see if I can do this. Uh, I created some, some products 
that I thought I could get into major retailers and drugstore chains. And I was like playing with them and I'm not an engineer. And so I was like, yeah, I think there's something here. Uh, and I, I brought it to an engineer. I said, make me like, a, just, just make this look decent. Uh, march my way into Walgreens. And, and now, you know, we have products in every drugstore in the country. And so you never know what's going to become some, you know, something. So you, you constantly change is sort of the only constant, like everything you're doing is about an evolution. Um, and you've got to be able to sort of go with the times. Right. And so, uh, I I think that's been a core part of our DNA and my DNA is to always look around seeing what's next and you know a lot of the things that you started doing like they might not be the thing that's going to sort of drive your long-term success uh, and that's okay I think uh, the ability, uh, you know, I, I, there's there's obviously a great quote out there that some of you might have heard. I mean, there's there's really two things that drive top line revenue for for any business, and it's innovation and and marketing. And those are the two things. All the other parts of our business are cost structures, right? Our accounting, our customer service, our manufacturing, our operations. And so, you know, if you can sort of incorporate those two things as part of your DNA, you know, uh, marketing and and innovation, um, there's so much opportunity. That's where all the top line comes in. So I would say never stop innovating, thinking through ideas, you know, we want to be pragmatic about how much time and effort we put in, hence the MVP. Um, but for me that, you know, that, that, that kind of change has, has been a, a really major contributor to, to the overall growth and success of, of businesses I've been associated with. Nice. Now I'm, I'm going to ask a bit of a bit of a deep question. What would you say is one of the biggest mistakes you made as an entrepreneur? Oh, that's easy for me. Um, you know, I was, um, um, I had acquired some, some products. They were actually in the photo space. They were, uh, 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 I found some uh, amazing new products that were innovative and inventive. And I said, wow, I want to, I want to buy this company. I want to, I want to be the sole rights. I want to manufacture these. They were brand new. Nobody had them. And I was just like, this is going to be, I think this could be big. I uh, went out to uh, local shows. I met with executives at like all the major companies, the Kodaks, the Fujis, all the companies that would ultimately distribute this product for me. And they're like, Ryan, this is a home run. This is an amazing product. We've never seen anything like it. So what did I do next? I went ahead and I started building out this factory to get ready for, for to make this product, right? Spent a ton of money. Uh, it was actually seven figures. We invested. All right, world, here we are. We've got the product and, and people didn't want to buy it. You know, everyone said they wanted to buy it, but people were actually weren't putting down their credit card various reasons. Um, and I'm sitting here scratching my head. Well, I got this whole factory, you know, ready to go. Um, and so, you know, that's sort of the departure from the MVP model is, uh, you know, you, you're sort of scaling the business prior to actually people paying for it. And so as excited as we get as entrepreneurs, we come up with an idea where like, it's just, it makes so much sense in our head, like people are going to want this. Are people going to pay for it? Let's get a small number of people to pay for something. Let's get the feedback loop going. Let's iterate the product. Let's bring back the right product to the market that more people are willing to pay for. Let's get a working revenue model that makes sense and let's scale appropriately. So for me, it was definitely scaling in advance. We were actually able to take that particular company, pivot to other products and actually drive outside success, but it took a while and it was a lesson that I've always learned and will not make again in the future. So a valuable lesson for sure. Yeah, and you know, folks that are out there that think that, you know, I don't need to go through this process. I don't need to find an MVP. I got to tell you, Mac, uh, their first product they came out with was a complete flop. Their computer, it was actually way of, ahead of its times. Uh, nobody knew they needed this concept. And, and you know, they came out with this massive computer and it, and it failed. Uh, and then they went back and they realized, okay, they're, they're, they, we basically created a, a Ferrari when people are actually just asking for a bike right now, right? And so they kind of went back to the drawing board and it took them several, almost a decade before they came out with a successful product. So again, even the most uh, successful companies go through this process and they have these moments, right? Now, now Ryan, we, we went through one of the, you know, the mistakes, what would we, what would you consider one of your busy, biggest successes as an entrepreneur? Gosh, uh, that's a great question. Um, you know, we've done a lot of really interesting things. I think for me, it's assembling the right team. At the end of the day, it's all people. So, um, you know, there's there's process and there's people. You need great people to help ensure a great process. I'm very fortunate. Um, I've got a great president who runs several of the divisions that we have. His name's Harvest Kramer. A shout out to him. He's been with me, gosh, uh, almost since the beginning. Um, and, you know, it's hard for me to do what I do without people like him. And everybody listening here, if you are working with somebody, if you have employees, 
you are probably going to say people is the most challenging part. It is because you're dealing with different personality types. Um, how do you as a leader get, you know, how are you effective with each person? How do you get the best outcome? How does each person you know, need to be communicated with? Um, and it's not perfect. It's a fluid situation. You know, you're, you're, there's people that are moving around. You're getting new people in. you have new hires. Um, I think we've been really fortunate to have a really core team that's been with us for a long time. That's really believed in the vision. Um, that's really helped make sure that, um, you know, the idea of, of, of customer love, like we're not coming to work every day to do something like, okay, like we're going to spend 40, 50, 60 hours a week. Like, let's be great. Let's try and be better than the rest. And let's put our best foot forward. Um, you can't be successful ultimately without people that have that shared vision and, and mindset. So I'd say above all, um, that's the thing that really drives and makes everything work. Um, and I think in addition to that, it's just this continued uh, thirst for innovation, for ideation, for MVPs, for seeing where we can build value across any of the businesses or ideas we come up with. And um, they don't all work, but we've had a lot of great wins and it's built you know, a really great company um, in a lot of industries. And so um, you know, I'd say that would be the, the feedback I would share. Yeah, you know, folks, you, you got to have you got to make sure you have the right people on the bus. Like at the end of the day, Starbucks coffee isn't the greatest folks, but sometimes and usually isn't always. And so when I order my Starbucks, I don't want it to be correct sometimes or usually I want it to be correct always. And again, Starbucks isn't the greatest coffee in the world. I'll be completely transparent and say that. But with that said, I keep going back because of their service. I love being able to order on my app and it's there and it's consistently made uh, correctly, you know, pretty consistently. So I, I can't complain. Uh, but, you know, also again, hiring the right people is so important as Ryan was saying, because, you know, I, I think I mentioned this on the previous show, uh, there's three types of people in the workplace, right? There's the engaged employee, there's the RIP employee, and there's the cave employee. So the, the engaged employee, we all love, right? They come to work every day, they, they're engaged, they they go a little bit beyond, they try to do more, right? Those are the people like like the, uh, Ryan mentioned his president, right, that he currently has. And then you have the RIP employee, the retired in place employee. I don't mind those folks, right? Because I can actually engage an individual who's retired in place to kind of come and do the bare minimum every day, and that's okay. But the ones that are very difficult are the cave employees. They're constantly against virtually everything. They hate the parking. They hate the employees. They hate their staff. They hate that they have to come to work. And the reason those individuals are so difficult is because when you hire a new employee, it's the cave employees that will actually be the ones training them sometimes. And what are they training them on? right? They're training on how much they hate the job, how much they hate their coworkers and all these other things. So making sure you have the right people on the bus is, is just as important. And, and as Ryan said, it, it kind of comes from the top down. You know, Ryan is engaging his staff and saying, hey, these are the issues we're going through. And this is this is what I'm personally going through as well. Uh, and this is trying to how we're con con continue to scale this business. And it all kind of depends on all of us. We're a team. And I do believe in engaging uh, employees at a very early stage within the marketing process or strategy process, they then buy into that, right? Because they feel the ownership of this, this process. And now they kind of feel like, well, this need, I need to be successful because I help plan this marketing. I help plan this strategy or outreach or sales, right? And so really just engaging them early and often is really going to create a, a foster, uh, a foster to kind of a culture of, of you know, customer centric approaching uh, to, to your business, right? And, and that's really kind of important when you're, when you're thinking of building a brand. Yeah, absolutely. You know, one, one simple test I like to do when I'm interviewing people is, this idea of, uh, you know, could you sit next to this person on a cross country flight, right? And, uh, you know, not at, not that everyone has to have charisma, but you know, you kind of get a vibe and, um, you know, somebody might be skilled, but to your point, if they're a cave employee, if they're a detractor, if, you know, they see things in a more negative light, um, that sort of takes all creativity away. And a lot of times, um, yes, if we're doing a task, we might not need creativity maybe we're, we're sitting at a cubicle or an office and we're like we're doing something in front of us but a lot of things when you're building a company require creative thinking and you know it's really hard to think creatively uh with negative energy you know and so uh you know i i think having positivity optimism it's almost a prerequisite for early days growth um because you're sort of building something that's very difficult and if you don't think you can build it you're not going to build it Right. If you can see yourself at the end of that finish line, you're going to get to the finish line. You have to believe it. You've got to dream it. You've got to be excited about it. And you need other people that can be excited, too. It doesn't mean that you have to have 
um, you know, uh, enthusiasm for things that are unrealistic. It, it, it's great to put yourself around other people that have different differences of opinion, but sort of a shared value set, right? And shared beliefs, and I think shared, you know, optimism. Yes, I completely agree. Now, Ryan, we've got a lot of folks, a lot of entrepreneurs is kind of either in the beginning, middle or ending of their entrepreneurial uh, journey listening and also folks just interested in entrepreneurship. You know, you've been doing this for some time, you're very successful. What advice would you give an aspiring entrepreneur? Yeah, well, I talked to a lot of entrepreneurs and I, you know, everyone I talk to would like to see their businesses bigger, right? Or more successful. And, and I don't care what stage you're at. I don't think there's any entrepreneur in the world that wouldn't want to see that. And I think one of the easiest things that entrepreneurs can do today is obviously, you know, we all need to define who we serve, but break it down obviously a little bit further. Who is your ideal customer? We call it an ICP. Who is the core customer that gets the most benefit from what you do? And I guarantee for almost any company, there are a lot more of those customers out there that, that you know, when we, uh, when we market correctly and when we find those customers, there is so much more opportunity to drive your business. So, you know, if your core audience are, you know, uh, tailors, you know, and you, you've got tailors in, you know, the Northeast, you know, um, do you know who all the tailors are in, across, across the rest of the country? There are tools today that you can find use, whether it's a uh, Zoom Info or Apollo, where you can go in and say, hey, I want to I want to find everyone who's a tailor. You can get their emails. You can drop them into drip marketing, you know, automated outbound emails. You know, it's amazing how many people don't have the engines going, you know, figure out what the universe of your ICPs are get all of their information and, and find ways to message them. It's such an easy way to, to grow. Um, and I think most people just wait for their phones to ring, or maybe they have a little bit of search engine marketing. You have to be proactive. You know, the world is not going to come to you. You have to bend the world um, to your own reality. And you've got to go out there and be very proactive, but start with who is your ICP and identify all of them get their contact information, figure out how to message them, advertise them. You know, it's very easy to grow when you deliver the right message to that ICP. So we want to be narrow. We don't want to be like, oh, everyone's a customer, but let's deliver them the right message wherever they are. But certainly start with discovery. Uh, I think that's just an easy way to, to, to get your business moving in the right direction. That's very true. In fact, I literally just had a conversation with my colleague just the other day. And one of the things I was encouraging, she's she's new to the role. One of the things I was encouraging to do, I was like, okay, here's our here's how we break down the state from a market perspective. We have 33 counties, but that's too many counties. So we broke it down to patient service areas. So within these zip codes, this is where these zip codes primarily go receive patient care for. Now, with these patient service areas, what I want you to do is I want you to go and identify all the pediatric clinics within those areas. So now once we understand that, okay, now we understand, okay, who's the market, then we'll, what we'll do is we'll, we'll actually put some payers mix into it. So again, some of our, our insurance products are actually competitors. So we know they're not going to come to my system. So I exclude them from a market. Now I have the true market size. Okay. Now, now again, going back to your point, I'm, I'm essentially creating the, uh, creating my customer profile. Right. So now I know who it is. And then, then I begin to, okay, what am I trying to grow? Am I trying to grow cardiovascular care, cancer care, melanoma? What is it that I'm trying to grow? And then going back to that customer profile, okay, who fits within this mold? Okay. 50 year old Caucasian living on the coast. Okay. That's my melanoma patients. Right. Some people think in Oregon, it's always, you know, rainy. That's true. But the overcast actually creates a lot more EV rays. Uh, so you actually get a lot more uh, melanoma out here in this coastal region. And so again, just understanding your market, understanding what it is that you're trying to accomplish as well within that market is very important. Uh, that's the discovery stage. And once you kind of get to that point, then you begin to understand, okay, what do your customers consider valuable? Because again, you can't create value. Your customers already know what's valuable to them. You're just trying to amplify that value in a way that brings them back to becoming a loyal customer. Uh, and then once you've identified that, as, as Ryan mentioned, then you now you have a loyal customer. And then continually, repetitively being consistent on what you're doing and your value proposition is important. Because again, if, if you're not consistent, no matter what you no matter how good your branding or how good anything is, it's consistency is the one that truly is going to win over a lot of your customers. Uh, and, and Ryan mentioned it too, even if you screw up, it's okay, because if you screw up, 
that's a good opportunity for you to reach back out to that customer, uh, build again that personal uh, relationship, talk about the trust and talk about, hey, how you're going to correct that issue, acknowledging that the issue was uh, made and you're going to correct it. That goes a long, long way, especially uh, using Ryan's services and having some note that looks like a handwritten note going back to that customer uh, addressing that issue. I think for, for me personally, that would that would certainly take me back and, and I would be like, wow, this is a really good company. I want to continue to you know work with yeah can't, couldn't agree more sorry my my phone just decided to ring right in the middle of this conversation folks so ryan is there any last words you have to say no i think we hit on a lot of great topics you know i think um you know there's just, there's a lot of opportunity we live in an incredible place with so much the market is so big um you know and it, it's great for entrepreneurs you can go out there and, and get a piece right figure out what greatness looks like uh do your best to say we're going to be great you know have that positive uh mindset find those customers and get those customers to love you right that's really uh the key to driving long-term success yes yes and get the customers to love you and in fact listeners if you love the shades of entrepreneurship you can actually visit the shades of e.com to subscribe to the newsletter or you can visit us on the social site at the shades of E on pretty much all the social soul channels. Uh, and again, if you're so inclined, if you love us so much, please, I would highly encourage you to become one of our patrons for $5 a month to help support the show, bring the marketing, bring in individuals like Ryan. Uh, so he can talk about some of the phenomenal things that he's doing. Cause again, this is a free education for you folks that are listening, a really good opportunity to kind of expand your education, entrepreneurial education, and, and really begin to think about what is it that you want to do? Maybe maybe you need to scratch that entrepreneurial itch uh, because remember, you know, our economy is built on the back of small businesses like you. And so in order for us to continue to succeed, we need more small businesses to continue to succeed. So Ryan, again, thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, again, folks, Ryan's information will be on the newsletter the week before the episode airs, the week the episode airs, and the week the episode airs. There'll also be a dedicated blog post with the transcription of our conversation as well as the audio for those that were uh, looking for it. Ryan, again, thank you again so much for being on the show. I, I, it looks like uh, it looks like it's a beautiful day out there in Maryland. All right. I'm going to jump on the jet ski now that we're all done. But no, uh, we had a, had a great time chatting with you. Uh, so great that you're doing this for, for the entrepreneurs out there and putting out great co content. Really appreciate it. Had a lot of fun today. Awesome. Enjoy the jet ski and folks. Thank you and have a great night.